back to the middle of culture. I'm one of your hosts, Eden. And I'm your other host, Peter. Hey, Peter. How are you? <laughs> Deal. Well, here's the thing, uh, listeners. I already know how Peter has been, which is why I, I approached him in such a somber tone. Because I know he's had a time. <laughs> here's what I'll say briefly. It's been a real monster of a week that started off with... Uh, a bad car accident that realistically could have ended up much, much worse than it did. Uh, fortunately, those involved are fine and are doing well. And the car is totaled and that's okay because it's just a car and we can replace that. And so that kind of set the stage for the week and between work and everything else, that's how it's been. And so uh, wonderfully, gratefully, Eden, you're a nice understanding person who uh, is going to kind of help spearhead this one tonight because we're not going to be talking about X-Men Apocalypse. I tried to start watching it and my brain just couldn't handle it this week. So this will be a little, little more freewheeling, perhaps a little more low key because I had a really shit week. You know what? How are you? <laughs> I'm I'm doing much better than that, and I'm sorry you've have a, you've had a rough week, a rough set of weeks. Um, but yes, the oh, the winter of our ex content, as I have decided to dub the last three X Men movies, uh, will continue. Ooh, that's good. Later, <laughs> oh, especially that's good. because apparently nice. uh, Apocalypse is very bad, so it is our ex content. Uh, it is our discontent oh, that we have to watch that, these. You know, in a in a preview fashion, let's just say. Um, I haven't been terribly impressed with what I have seen of Apocalypse thus far. On a scale of 1 to 10, how badly did it make you want to watch Power Rangers the movie so that you could see the real Ivan Ooze? Oh, you know, I haven't thought about that movie. Well, which which one? The the old one? Like that first one that you The and one I that you and I went were... to. Oh yeah, God, I don't remember anything about that. So I, it it unfortunately did not make me want to watch that. But I think that that's only because of uh, a lack of familiarity with that uh, version. Well, of here's Power here's the only reason why I say what I say. I am going to drop a picture in the chat uh, for our call so that you can see why I make this joke every time anyone brings up. X-Men Apocalypse and sent on the left. You can see Oscar Isaac's Apocalypse from X-Men Apocalypse. And on the right, you can see oh, yes. the antagonist of Power Rangers, the movie Ivan Ooze. And really <laughs> they're the same character. And I would say, I would say that, that Ivan Ooze might actually look better. He just might. He turns into Ooze too. So that's pretty cool. Uh, that movie does suck. I tried to watch it a couple of years ago, and I did not make it past the opening scene, which was them, the Power Rangers, all going skydiving with Bulk and Skull. And I was like, I can't, I can't do this. I just simply cannot. Uh, and so, no, I have not watched that recently. But I do remember <laughs> Ivan News. Well, I do look forward to us in a little bit of time talking about X Men Apocalypse, but. But tonight, we shan't. Tonight, Indeed. we'll do something different. Indeed. Tonight, we are just going to kind of... This is going to be our year-end wrap-up episode because we want to just do something a little relaxing, a little freewheeling, and just kind of chat about the media that we... You know, we often talk at the beginning of each episode about what we've, you know, kind of watched or, or played or listened to or read over the last couple of weeks. But this is going to kind of be the benediction on the year. Um, and so what Peter kind of suggested is that we talk a little bit at first about our music as I, as a Spotify user, received my Spotify wrapped a few days ago. And he, as an Apple Music user, has Apple's also a sad, sad Apple Music user. also run wrap up of some sort. <laughs> yeah. Look, let's be honest, though. Let's job. be honest, though. Spotify is a bad company who stole the Spotify wrapped from one of their employees who they then let go and did not give any credit for, for in creating Spotify wrapped as a concept. They're an evil, evil company that I should stop giving my $18 a month to. <laughs> Just want to, I want that you know, on the I, record. I, I can't argue with that because I, 
I don't know enough. And I'll say that, you know, at one point I did actually have a Spotify subscription because there is no question that their recommendations, their kind of auto generated playlists and stuff are far superior to Apple music's. But I just didn't use it that much because I am a very intentional music listener. I very rarely want to be surprised. And so when I go to listen to music, most of the time I'm like, okay, what album do I want to listen to? And then I find an album and I start and I go from there. It is rare for me to shuffle things, although I do have a few playlists that are very sort of genre specific and stuff that, uh, that I'll, I'll, I will put on shuffle, but yeah, I just didn't find that I was very rarely using the discover weekly or whatever playlists to the point that it made, didn't make any sense for me to be paying 10 bucks a month for it when I was already paying for Apple music. For sure. See, I do. I look forward every Monday to my discover weekly because I would say once a month, it's trash two weeks of the month. It's pretty okay. And at least once a month, they knock it out of the park. And at least 60 to 75% of those songs are real bangers that I'm then like, Oh, this is really good. This is really good. Um, and I have found a lot of really great music through my discover weekly, a lot of really cool artists who I probably never would have heard of any other way. Um, so I do have to, uh, a, I do enjoy my discover weekly. I, too, am more uh, outside of Discover Weekly. I'm a more intentional listener like you. I basically use Discover Weekly on Monday mornings to try to find if there's anything new I want to try this week. And if not, then I'm back to I only listen to albums because I'm that bitch. Yeah, I'm not going to. I'm not, I'm not going to put a playlist together of my favorite single tracks from different artists. I can't do that. I respect it. Can't do it. Um, yeah, no. So I listen to whole albums. When I make, yeah. When I make playlists, it is almost always, um, playlists of full albums. For example, one of my most played playlists is simply titled quoth the Raven. And I, I try and sometimes think that I'll be clever when I name my playlists. And so the al- the playlist quoth the Raven is all albums that members of the band Nevermore have played in. Oh, including that's Including all of Nevermore's albums. That's cute. So it's Nevermore, it's Sanctuary, it's Ghost Ship Octavius, it's Jeff Loomis's solo stuff. Uh, it's, it's that kind of stuff. And, and that I will shuffle mostly when I'm like at work in the operating room and stuff to try and keep it. But yeah, like I, I have only one or two playlists that have, that are like single songs at a time. Uh, one of them is uh, simply titled brutal with uh, umlauts over the U of course. Naturally. Uh, and, and that's just like, I don't know the, the heaviest songs in my playlist or in my library and stuff like that. But yeah, most of the time, even if I do make a playlist, it's full albums of a particular either artist or genre. For example, the, my funeral doom playlist, it's full albums, but it's all funeral doom. Uh, and, and that I'll, sh- I'll shuffle those again when I'm at work in surgery, things like that to kind of just keep it going and not have to worry about, Oh, we got to the end of this album. Hey, will you go start something else? Uh, but yeah, I, I mostly listen to. So I, uh, I opened up my playlists on Spotify. There are exactly seven playlists in my Spotify. So as you can see, I'm not a, sp- I'm not a playlist user. They are yeah. as follows, uh, a collection of all of MF Doom's, uh, hip hop instrumental music from three or, or three or four albums of his. So again, it's just a series of albums. Uh, the entirety of fresh air one through eight by Mannheim steamroller. Okay. The entirety of Ghosts 1 through 7 by Nine Inch Nails so that you can listen to them in succession without having to figure out how to cue the separate albums together. Sure. Lo-Fi Beats to Study 2, which I did not make. Lo-Fi Girl made, but I just saved that playlist. Uh, the Genshin Impact 
uh, soundtrack also did not make that. Mihoyo made that themselves, and they just keep it up to date with all of the latest releases. But if I ever want to listen to Genshin, I might throw that on, put it on uh, shuffle, my Discover Weekly playlist, and then Persona 5, but just the Lin songs. So I went through all three Persona 5 soundtracks and just picked out all the songs with vocals. And that is literally the only thing I listen to on shuffle is that single playlist. Wow. And other than You're that, it's far all more intentional than I it's, am. Other than that, it's all albums all the time. And if the whole album isn't good, sorry, Buster, you don't make the cut and you don't get to be saved to my albums list. <laughs> there you, I have far more playlists than that. Uh, I won't go into them all because they're, they're just too voluminous, just too many, but you know, I, again, I, I like to think that sometimes I'm a little, uh, a little clever and I'm really not, but I think I am like, I have a playlist titled a mournful mass and it is a mashup of the mass albums by Amin Ra and the albums by Morn, uh, M O R N E. They're a band from Boston. And even though they're a little different, there were some similarities that I felt those two went well together. You know, I have one titled A State of Denial. Uh, They're all artists that are focusing on Egyptian death metal. So, (laughs) you know. That's a good one. I like State of Denial. That's very good. Yeah. I mean, you know, we've got got some Chakran, some Crescent, some Nile, some some stuff like that. Uh, I have an elder list, and it's just a playlist that is all bands whose music focuses on Lovecraftian Cthulhu mythos type stuff. So, you know, that kind of stuff. Nice. So, uh, thinking about our music consumption this year, you took a look at your year in review or looked at the things you listened to most this year. What, what if anything stuck out to you? What was new? What was interesting? What surprised you? What didn't surprise you? Well, because we talked about it earlier, that uh, collaboration album between Johannes Persson of Cult of Luna and Perturbator, um, Final Light, is uh, the song In the Void from that album was my number one song this year. And that album made it into my, let's see, I think that was my, oh gosh, where was it? Interesting. It doesn't have it in my top 10 albums, but I listened to that quite a bit. Uh, it did happen to tell me that I'm in the top 100 of Apple Music listeners in terms of people who've, you know, the amount I have listened to that album. So Wow, the top 100. That, that was, well, yeah, but just of Apple Music listeners who listen to it. You know, Still. That's not that. Um, the other, you know, there the other ones, I don't know that I'd really say there was any, there were any real big surprises uh, because my other top things were kind of, new music from some stalwart act that uh, I expected to really like and fortunately really did. Uh, my number one artist for the year, Russian Circles. And that is well-earned because their most recent album, Gnosis, is a banger of an album. It's very like, good. It is. Whew, it is good. Um, you know, uh, Lamb of God got a lot of play this year. They had a new album come out. Uh a Legion had a new album come out and it's probably my favorite album of theirs. It was my, I think number two most played album of the, no, actually I think it was my number one most played album of the year in terms of whole albums that, Mm. um, you know, the new album from zeal and ardor got quite a bit of play. I really, really enjoyed that one as well as, uh, machine head. Uh, their new album was actually much better than I expected. And that was a pleasant surprise that got quite a bit of play as well. Nice. So, you know, um, a little cult of Luna in there again, solid stalwart band that I wasn't surprised that their new album was as good as it was, but it was very good. Uh, one of the other big surprises for me this year, and it landed in my number seven top album spot, um, was the album Agenda 21 by the band Zero Hour. Uh, Zero Hour is a sort of technical, progressive band. It was formed by twin brothers Troy and Jason Tipton. And I think, I could be wrong, but I think Troy was the bass player. Jason was the guitarist. Um, Troy has had some tendonitis issues and things like that that have really limited his ability to keep playing bass, particularly in the extremely 
fast sort of technical way that he did. And so their last album actually came out in, I think, 2008, uh, Dark Deceiver. And I loved it. It was great. And then all of a sudden in 2022, they kind of reformed with the original drummer, the original vocalist, Eric Rosevold, uh, and then a new bass player and released uh, a really, really good kind of progressive metal album uh, that has, uh, it was exciting. I didn't expect ever really to hear more music from Zero Hour, but I certainly didn't expect what they put out to be as an album, perhaps their strongest work ever. Oh, wow. Um, they're, yeah, they're, they're, they have an EP called The Towers of Avarice. Uh, that EP is, it's funny that it's an EP because I still think it's 43 minutes long, but it is, it is officially classified an EP. Uh, that's probably still their best work, but Agenda 21, not too far for me behind uh, the Towers of Avarice. So that was actually really exciting to uh, to get some new music from them and then have it turn out to be so dang good. Yeah, that's always that's always great when that happens. Yeah, it really was. Um, looking to see, I, I do think this is funny, my four-year funeral, my funeral doom playlist, and my instrapostal, which is my instrumental post-metal playlist, uh, those are two of my top playlists this year, and I can tell you why that is. That is because those are good playlists to sleep to. So <laughs> yeah. So if I wake up in the middle of the night uh, sometimes and have a hard time falling back to sleep, uh, Funeral Doom is really, really good to listen to in that it tends to be slow, it tends to be quite low, a lot of sub bass in it. The vocals are all so harsh and so growly that you don't understand the words. The vocals are really more just a layer to the music rather than something that can distract you. Your mind cannot engage with the lyrics because they are unintelligible. And so it tends to kind of, I don't know, it just sort of creates a nice white noise that I, I can sleep to. Although I'm pretty sure the nights I've slept to that playlist I have really, really weird dreams. So I bet you know. <laughs> correlation does not absolutely mean causation, but in this case, it could be causational. Do you know? Here's a here's a thing. Do you know what album I sometimes fall asleep to, and the next morning I always almost always think to myself, I don't know if that was the right choice. That is <laughs> that? Philip Glass's Koyaniskatsi. Are you familiar with this music at all? Uh, not that particular album, though. I am familiar with Philip Glass. So, and, you know, that's enough for me to go. Oh, post yeah. post yeah, classical music, it. late period classical music. Koyanis Katsi is the album length soundtrack to one of the most fascinating documentaries that you will literally ever see, because it is just a series of moving images with this incredible Philip Glass accompaniment to it. There's no story to it. It's the story of humanity because it is just a series of images and short clips of the natural world, the technological world, the world that we have built, the ways that which we disconnect from each other and the ways with which we connect with each other. Um, it's an incredible film. Like, even just to have on in the background of your life, to turn Koyanis Katsi on, have the music playing, have the images go, and then have it be, have it be like, ambient to your life is really incredible. However, it's a weird album to sleep to. Yeah. Your dreams get weird. Yeah. Uh, that's why I've kind of moved away from the Funeral Doom playlist for sleep, and I'm more likely to go with the instrumental post-metal I bet that album has a lot of real bangers that I probably also listen to because post metal was my second most common uh, genre according to my Spotify Wrapped. I was gonna say, tell I've spoken plenty about mine. Tell us about your Spotify Wrapped. Um, what interesting things did you see in that? So interesting things I saw in this. I was surprised is not the right word for it but also kind of surprised. My number one album for 2022 was also my number one album from 2021. Pharaoh Sanders and Floating Points, Incredible Promises, which, you know, in our very first episode that we were talking about music, 
I said yeah. is one of the greatest albums I've ever heard in my life and is probably, I think, the greatest album to come out in the last 10 years. And that remains true um, because it is the album I listen to the most. Um, and my top five is literally the first five movements of that nine movement piece of music. Uh, so nice. not a very fun or interesting top five songs <laughs> uh, because it is. Here's an interesting thing. I listened to them, I think, all the same amount of times because this is an album you don't skip around it. You start with movement one and you listen till the end, till you reach the end of movement nine. But for some reason, spots one, two, three, four, five are one, two, five, three, four. <laughs> so why is That's movement <laughs> five number three? Movement three, number four, and movement four, number five? Because I would bet dollars to donuts I have listened to all three of those tracks the exact same number of times. There is no world where I have heard movement five sense. more than movement three. So why did they put them in that order? Maybe it's... The only thing I can imagine is that maybe... Because Spotify gets weird about how many times tracks are played and then how long tracks are. Maybe five is a little bit shorter. So that's why it jumps ahead. Mm. I don't know. Okay. But anyway, so that was my most listened to album. My most listened to artist, which again is just due to the voluminous number of tracks on the album, um, is the newest album by 18 Carat Affair, which I've also mentioned on this podcast before. It's called Body Double um, and is a vaporwave album that came out a few months ago. And every song I'm going to is like a, a minute or less. So if you listen to that album a few times, guess what? You listen to 500 tracks by that artist. Cause you listen to a 50 track album 10 times. So that was my number one yeah. artist, according to uh, Spotify. Um, some other notable uh, artists I listened to a lot of, I really got back into cloud cult, um, which on any given day, I would put in my top three bands of all time. So it was really fun to get back uh, on that uh, that um, train because they hadn't really put out an album since 2017 and that or 2016, I guess, is when The Seeker came out. And The Seeker kind of left me cold. I thought it was maybe I, I still think it's probably their very weakest album. So that kind of just got me out of the habit of listening to them. But they put sure. out their newest album, Metamorphosis, earlier this year, and it is incredible. It's very good. It's a very good return to form for them. Um, so I listened to a lot of that album, and then I listened to a lot of their previous albums, just going back and remembering why I loved this band so much. Uh, so they were also in my top five. Uh, and then, like I said, Pharaoh Sanders and, and Floating Points was in there. Uh, and, you know, just some fun stuff. Uh Nothing really too surprising outside of that. Let me just flip through this really quick, see if there's anything else that really shocked me. I was in the top 0.05% of 18 Carat Affair listeners, so I don't have nice. number. I don't have a num numerical breakdown like you do, but, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, you know. Um, but, yeah, I... There were a lot of artists that I had listened to. Or, oh, Godspeed You Black Emperor is on my top five because, of course, it is. I'm always listening to Godspeed You Black Emperor. Also, another one of those bands that, gun to my head, is in my top three favorite bands of all time. So, like, depending on the day, the top three rotates between four bands. Neurosis, Cloud Cult, Godspeed You Black Emperor, and Rush. What is my taste in music? That's an interesting mix. What a weird mix. Rush simply because they yeah, were the first. Neurosis because they're like the greatest metal band ever. Cloud Cult because yeah. I like indie pop, I guess. Indie pop rock. And then Godspeed You Black Emperor, the world's weirdest post-rock band. Anyway, it's a weird, weird choice. That's an interesting, interesting mix. One thing I will say um, that I do... I don't know how I would say this. I, I thought that the Apple Music replay thing was interesting and it showed some stuff that, again, wasn't surprising. But there is definitely a fair bit that got left out because I don't just listen in Apple Music. Of course. Uh, you have a bunch of stuff in your being, plaques, right? You know, right. Being the weirdo that I am when I can, it is not uncommon for me to use... Uh, you know, Plex amp or uh, most often what I use is rune. 
uh, and and will stream from my server to a nice set of speakers or a nice set of headphones or something via Rune. And so I know there's a lot of stuff that I listen to. Like I, I listened to an awful lot uh, this year of Raphael Weinroth Brown, and he just didn't show up anywhere in Apple Music Replay because most of the time, if I wanted to listen to him, I wanted it to really be an experience. And so it was via Rune with a really nice set of speakers or something like that. Cause I don't know if you're familiar with him at all. Uh, I might've posted something in our family's discord, um, uh, about that. He's a cellist and does a lot of kind of building songs by looping and does, you know, all these songs, all just him and his cello, but by recording a little bit and then looping it and then playing more and looping it and that sort of thing. Sure. And he's, he's, he's got some really beautiful, beautiful songs that, uh, I, I spent a lot of time listening to that. And then, uh, one of his other works, uh, bands, groups that he's in musk ox, that kind of chamber trio of classical guitar, uh, violin and the cello, uh, listen to a lot of that, but again, mostly from my server. Uh, and so, that didn't get represented in a, a fair way, but that would be the other big thing that kind of got left out just because I didn't listen to it very much in Apple Music. Sure. I'm looking through. I thought it would be fun to see what are the recently added albums to my saved list because that'll be kind of a good a good view of like, what, am I, what have I been listening to recently? I have to say the new SZA album came out today. So I've listened to it like three or four times. It's a banger. She has done it again. She left us high and dry for five years since her last album came out. Um, but this new one is a, a banger. Like, I thought Control, when that came out in 2017, that was my album of the year for 2017. No question. I listened to it a kajillion times. I thought it was incredible. And then she did that great couple of songs on the Black Panther soundtrack in 2018. And I never heard a song from her again until like this month she came back and SOS so far is really really good it's got like 25 songs on it it's like over an hour long which is long for a, a you know an R&B uh, album but I'm very excited to listen to more of it I think it's incredible so far um, another artist I got into this year that I had never really heard of before and it's one of those ones where it was like how has how has this person stayed off my radar for so long because they're so incredibly my shit that I think regardless of when I would, you know, my music taste has changed drastically over the course of the last 20 years of my life and during my adulthood. However, I genuinely think that even if you had introduced me as a senior in high school to Terry Riley, I would have been into him back then. I'm just as into him now. He's a freaking weirdo and his music is bizarre and I really, really like it. Cool. I mean, I still think the harp of New Albion is like doing something I've never heard with music before. And that's just him and a purposefully tuned weird piano. And it's two hours of just like this new type of music washing over you. It's incredible. It's one of those things where it was like, if this didn't require me to completely retune my piano in this hellscape of sound... I would learn how to play this because it is incredible and it moves me and I wish that I could play this for myself instead of just listening to it. However, it would require me to inexorably change my grand piano to be tuned for just that. And guess what I don't want to do? I don't really feel like popping open the baby grand and like fiddling with all the strings. <laughs> that's the sort of thing you do when you're Terry Riley, yeah, not when you're fair. me. Um, anyway, Harp of New Albion, it's freaking cool. It's two hours of weirdness. Terry Riley rules. Excellent. Well, is there anything that came out this year that you expected to be a lot more into and, and really just didn't get into it or that, you know, anything like that where you thought that, yeah, I was going to listen to this a lot more than I ended up listening to. Yeah. Um, a few, and they're almost all pop albums. I think this was a weak year for pop for me, and I don't know if it's just that I guess I'm I'm out of the pop phase of my listening habits, or if they were just not as strong as I'd hoped they would be. 
Um, mm-hmm. Haley Kiyoko had a new album come out, um, Panorama, which is her second full length album. She is also an artist who kept me waiting a long time for a new album um, because her album, what was her first album called? Uh, I can't think of it right now, um, but she is really great. Uh, Expectations. That's what her first album was called. It's extremely good and was one of those ones that was just like, yo, this is this is the sort of stuff like I wish that more people did. Um, but Panorama is just not quite doing it for me the same way. And that's a real bummer to me because I really wanted it to be good. Um, also I think that it was overshadowed by the fact that it came out the same day as Renaissance, the new Beyonce Knowles album. And that Uh. was a banger. That's a great album. It didn't show up in my list because I didn't listen to it enough to show up in my list, but Renaissance is a very good album. It's some of Beyonce's very strongest work. So obviously Haley Kiyoko's album was a little uh, uh, shined over by the fact that I could have been listening to Beyonce. And so that's what I did. Um, the new seems fair. the new Taylor Swift album just is really not doing it for me. I know a lot of people are really liking Midnight's. It's not doing it for me, which is a shame because I really liked evermore and folklore and i thought they were pretty good um and i liked the new like folksier direction she was going and i was hoping midnights would be really good but it's just not doing it for me um yeah it also also came out on a day where a better album came out that i would have rather listened to which was the new carly ray jepson album which not my favorite carly ray album i still think emotion is her best album but her newest one that came out a few weeks ago is also very good um, but yeah, those are my two big disappointments. I was hoping Haley's album would be better. I was hoping Taylor's album would be better. How about you? Yeah, there was actually quite a bit that, um, that I just, I don't know, didn't click for me or I kind of bounced off. Um, I'll make, I'll go through it pretty quick. One of these I talked about previously, and that is the latest album from Wilderun Epigone. Uh, it continues to be this kind of progressive big epic thing that really should be in my wheelhouse and I continue to just kind of go I can't get into it um spirit box I I have loved spirit box for many years I was a a very excited for eternal blue uh their their kind of debut album that came out I think it was I'm pretty sure it was last year yeah it was last year Uh, this year they had just a little three song ep or kind of collection of singles almost called rotoscope that came out and I don't know that I've even listened to all three of those songs all the way through. Um, something about, I mean, it still has all the spirit box isms, but for some reason that just wasn't, just wasn't hitting for me. Uh, Oceans of Slumber's newest Starlight and Ash. I absolutely love their previous albums. Um, this one is a little less heavy. It's a little more, I don't know. It's, it's still a beautiful album, but it just, it kind of, I kind of get bored with it. Uh, the newest Mashuga album, immutable. It's good, solid Mashuga, but I just haven't found myself listening to it a whole lot. Um, the new Megadeth album, kind of boring. I'll also say the new Metallica single, kind of bad. Look, when was the last time Metallica put out good music? I, I am a, I am a, 1988 with Justice for All. I was just going to say the last time. I want to be one of those people. No, we're both that person. We are both that person. We both know that the last time Metallica put out a genuinely good album in its entirety is And Justice for All. Black Album has like one good song and the rest is kind of trash. Reload has Give Me Fuel, Give Me Fire, Give Me That Which I Desire, which gets stuck in your head because it's got a great riff and they haven't had a single good song since. Yeah, I Metallica is one of those bands where I sound like I sound like the ultimate snobby hipster like yeah, Metallica is so overrated. But let's be honest, Metallica is super overrated because they really haven't done anything worth note since the 80s. And they did some really decent stuff in the 80s. I mean, Master is a fantastic album. I think uh, Ride the Lightning is really good and I think Injustice 
would be a fantastic album if it wasn't so difficult to listen to because the production on it and the mastering is garbage. Oh yeah. But yeah, like, uh, um, what else? Uh, there was something I, sorry, I was just looking at my recently added stuff. Cause there was something in there that kind of made me think of this whole, uh, Oh, so here's one that I listened to it and I go, yeah, I feel like I should like these guys, but at the same time, I'm starting to realize I don't think that death core is for me. So the new Lorna shore album, you know, I know a lot of people have been really big into it in, you know, in, in some of the blogs that I follow and, and, and even, you know, people I know in, in real life, the, some of the few people who listen to metal really dig this new Lorna shore stuff. And I don't know, you know, when I think of, for me, I like breakdowns more in the style of like lamb of God, old school lamb of God type breakdowns where you listen to these songs on the earlier lamb of God albums and you can literally listen to the song on the album and go, okay, right here is when the mosh pit is going to lose their ever loving minds. And those are the kind of breakdowns I want. And instead in a lot of death core and metal core, the breakdown is it just gets really slow. And I'm like, that doesn't do anything for me. So Fair. yeah, the new Lorna shore, not really doing much for me. I know that there's a few others that, you know, again, I'm like, ah, this should have really connected with me a lot more than it did. But I, I think I'd say those are kind of the big ones. There's a bunch of stuff that I look at and I go, Oh, I kind of wish I would have listened to that more, or I'd like to go and listen to that more and, and that sort of thing. And, uh, but yeah, I think those big disappointments and again, some of them from, you know, pretty big names or, or bands that, I don't know, like I say, have you even tried to listen to that Megadeth album? If you haven't, don't, if you have, I'm sorry. I haven't listened Just to Megadeth don't. since, uh, the aughts. So I'm good. You know, Megadeth is another one of those that, boy, they peaked early. I mean, they peaked rust in peace. Holy balls. Like that album, whew, you know, as much as I love master of puppets, I think that rust in peace is actually a better album. Um, when it comes to good old fashioned thrash metal, but boy, since then they've been really, it's, it's a lot more miss than it has been hit on the hit to miss ratio. I'm just not a thrash person because I don't know that I would ever bother listening to either Metallica or Megadeth ever again in my life (laughs) because there's so much other stuff that I haven't listened to or that I like more that I genuinely, I even thought to myself the other day, because I saw some, I saw some revisionist history on my Twitter timeline of somebody saying, yo, load and reload are actually good. And I was like, maybe they are. And then I opened up Spotify to click on them. And then I said, do you know what's better? Literally any of these other albums I've been listening to lately. So that's what I'll do instead. (laughs) If I'm going to listen, the one thing that I've listened to recently that was like blast from the past throwback, I listened to around the fur by the Deftones again lately. That's a good album still. That is a good album, but that's it. That's it. And for me, I think I, I want Metallica and Megadeth to put out something good because I really, really like thrash. Um, but at the same time, it doesn't upset me that they're not because we've got other good thrash bands that are keeping the dream alive and well. I mean, Testament is firing on all cylinders and their last four albums have been better than almost anything Metallica and Megadeth have ever done. And I know that there's a lot of people who disagree with that and that's okay. Cause they're wrong. Uh, death angel continues to be solid. Exodus is just ripping things up. And so I've got my thrash well covered, but there's that part of me that goes, you know, rust in peace and, uh, the black album were kind of two of the early albums that started to get me into real metal. Uh, and so I, I have that soft spot, but you know, it's okay. There's plenty of other bands who are doing it better and maybe have been doing it better for a few decades now. True enough. Okay. Any last final thoughts on music before we start talking about some other media? 
I don't think so. I think we've talked plenty about music. I think it'll probably, by by a large margin, be our biggest topic, simply because we had those handy recap things. And uh, well, and, I don't and watch. Honest, I don't me, watch enough TV or anything for like Hulu to give me like a recap of like, hey, you watched the entirety <laughs> of the Golden Girls while you were depressed this spring. How'd that go for you? And I could be like, it was <laughs> it was wonderful. It was delightful, actually. And, and see, for me, it's the fact that. TVs, movies, that kind of stuff has to be so extremely intentional uh, and music I can just have all the time. All True enough. I'm doing stuff that makes it so I, I consume obviously so much more than anything else. But yes, let's talk about a few other things. Okay, so um, this doesn't have to be things that came out in 2022, but just the thing that you liked the most that you engaged with. Okay during this year. How about let's start with books. What's your favorite book you read this year? It's a good question. I'm having a hard time thinking of all the books I've read and I'm not going to try and go to Goodreads and look and see, but I'll say briefly, probably the Nova incident by Dan Morin. Uh, it's, and I mentioned it, I think previously a few months ago when it came out, uh, Dan Morin is a technology writer, podcaster. I listen to a lot of podcasts that he's involved in and stuff. And, and I'm in a few discords with him. So kind of have that, you know, let's admit it fake, but sort of fake parasocial relationship with him. Uh, but he's actually a really solid science fiction author in addition. And it's a fun, uh, it's a fun sort of whodunit mystery detective noir type book set in a future science fiction uh, setting. And it was a lot of fun. It's only about 400, 450 pages. So it was a quick, easy read. And uh, I just blew through it and really, really enjoyed it. So I'd say that's probably my top book because uh, it's the, the, honestly, it's the one that stuck out enough that it came to mind. Nice. Uh, so I, I like to keep track of the things that I engage with. Um, this is a thing that I started doing this year for the first time. Um, and I thought about using like Goodreads or Letterboxd or something like that. But then I was like, do you know what's better than that? Writing it with a pen in a notebook like it's the 90s. <laughs> um, so I have actually um, this whole year I have been using um, for all of my scheduling and note taking and as my calendar, I have like a calendar that is a Golden Girls themed calendar actually that I bought at Target in their like bargain bin like section right at the front, you know, where it's like one, two or three dollars uh -huh. or whatever yep. the hell. Um, so I bought this. It was before I had even watched Golden Girls. Um, but it was a good, like, it was a good size. It had, like, a nice layout as a planner. And they had an office one, and I don't care for the office. It had a Shit's Creek one, and that was brown, and I didn't want it to be an ugly poo brown. And they had a Golden Girls one, which was this beautiful fluorescent pink. So I went with the beautiful fluorescent pink, and then I threw stickers all over the front so you can't see the Golden Girls on it anymore. Um, which is funny because I've liked this planner enough that I then, uh, you know, a few weeks ago hopped on the old eBay and bought myself three more of them because they are not dated. So I have three more of these exact planners to use for the next three years. It's a nice planner. Excellent. Uh, but in the back, in the notes section, I decided I'm going to jot down every book I read and every movie I watch. So I have those lists sitting right in front of me so that I can kind of make a decision about it. I'm going to make, I think I'm going to even keep more track of these things for next year. Cause it's fun to just look back and be like, Oh, what did I engage with this year? Um, so I have three answers for three different types of books. Uh, my favorite fiction book that I read, uh, is I'm going to say that it is probably, where is it at in this list here? Um, Where's my books? I read too many books. Uh, it is... The Grace of Sorcerers by Maria Ying is my favorite fiction book that I read this year. Um, I think I've mentioned okay. it on the pod. Uh, I just finished the sequel uh, a few days ago. It's called The Might of Monsters. It just came out a couple of weeks ago, and I just finished it. Incredible. Urban fantasy... I don't even like fantasy. Urban fantasy, however really good uh incre great world building incredible characters uh i loved it so that's my favorite fiction book that i read 
Uh, my favorite nonfiction book that I read is a bit embarrassing to say that I had not read it before, but I had read sections of it, but I had not read it in its entirety. Um, but I got it in, uh, I'm, I'm in, I'm really exposing how much of a loser I am in this episode between like, oh, well, I have a Golden Girls planner that I use and it has the gr- it has the gals on every page. And you can be like, oh, <laughs> look, <laughs> it's Blanche. She's laughing at the things that I'm putting into my planner. Um, also, uh, I am subscribed to a thing called Left Book Club, which is exactly what it sounds like. It was a thing that actually started back in the 30s. Um, where this, they basically print or reprint a, uh, a leftist text and then mail it to you. Um, and so, you know, every month I get in the mail, whatever book is their book club book that month. And they alternate between like seminal, like foundational texts in leftist thought, um, which have like a black cover on them and then newer releases with a yellow cover on it. So every month you get one or the other. It's really cute. They look really great on a shelf all alternating. It's cute. Anyway, this spring, I finally received Ain't I a Woman by Bell Hooks, which is a book I've meant to read for literal years. I'm a big Bell Hooks fan. I've read others of her books. I think she's incredible. I think that her work on pedagogy is great, and it informs a lot of the work that I do in my job incredible scholar, incredible thinker, one of the greatest, but I had never read her like seminal memoir slash feminist work, Ain't I a Woman? And I finally read that this year and it was everything I hoped it would be. It was an incredible text. Um, and the way that she weaves memoir with history, with polemic, um, and ties it all together into this just really propulsive, you read it almost compulsively because it makes you turn the pages because of the way that she has mastered the language. Um, it was just incredible. Uh, so yeah, Ain't I a Woman by Bell Hooks. If you want to be radicalized, listeners, that's a great place to start. And then there you go. I would I say... I admit I haven't read that one. I, I'm not surprised by that, but if you ever want to be radicalized, it's a good way to be radicalized. Um, and then <laughs> I would say, which, you know, do it. Do it. Just get radicalized. Join me. Join me in my brain diseases. <laughs> um, and then I have to say that my favorite comic that I read this year um, is volume 12 of A Bride's Story. Um, we have have a whole episode about why Bride's Story rules so much. Uh, and volume 12, I read, I read volumes 1 through 3 last year, and then I've read 4 through 13 this year. And 12, I think I settled on, was my favorite of them uh, that I read this year. If you want to know more about Bride's Story, go listen to that episode and then read all 13 volumes because it's the greatest comic ever made. There you go. So, uh, there you go. Let's talk a little bit about audio visual stuff. What was your favorite movie that you watched this year? Oh boy. I knew you were going to ask that. And I was trying to think what movies I've actually seen this year. This is um, why I write them down in the Golden Girls Planner. I don't think I've been to very many. I mean, yeah, honestly, think in theaters. It doesn't have to have the been in theaters. I've seen there. I know. I'm just. I'm, I'm trying to think of recent things. I. I don't watch a whole lot. Uh, I did enjoy Black Panther: Wakanda Forever. We went and saw that last I week, and I ended up. Was... I ended up liking it more than I thought I would. I. I had low expectations yeah. for it. I did not think that Letitia Wright was going to be able to carry it as well as she did. To be perfectly honest. Yep. No, I agree. I thought she, she surprised me as well. Um, yeah, I'll be honest. I, I cannot think of a movie that really jumped out at me this year, uh, whether at home in the theaters or anything that I watched and was like, wow, I, I want to watch that again. Um, you know, I, I had fun at Thor love and thunder. We talked about that. I haven't watched it since it's right there on Disney plus It'd be easy for me to watch. I haven't wanted to, I might have watched Mission Impossible 2 with my 17-year-old the other night. That's a bad movie that I enjoy more than it has any than I than, than it has any right for me to enjoy it. But ah, movies, yeah, I got nothing honestly. Nothing that sticks out at me. Okay. Well, here's the thing about Mission Impossible 2. It's the second worst Mission Impossible movie. It's a bad John Woo movie, but that means it's still entertaining. Even jo- Eve 
even a bad John Woo movie is still more fun than most movies you could be watching at any given moment. Oh, that's exactly what Alex said to me. Even as we got to the end, no, he, he turned to me at the end and I was like, it's pretty stupid, isn't it? And he goes, yeah, but I'm having fun. And I was like, that's, that's a, what that's, matters. That's why we're watching it because that's all that matters. That is what matters. I also went through and I watched all six of the mission impossible movies this last, uh, winter. I had never seen five Ooh. and six. Uh, they're pretty okay. Ooh. They're pretty okay. Oh, I love them. I think they're really okay. I, I here's like the thing. Oh, they're all pretty good. All six of them are pretty good. Three is the worst. No questions asked. And one is the best. No questions asked. But four, five, and six are all pretty solid. You can tell, you can tell oh, yes. that you're not getting... The, the fun thing about those first three is that even though I think J.J. Abrams is a bad director, um, it's fun to see how different those first three are. Because four, five, and six, yes. while are very cool movies, do a really good job, have some really stellar action sequences, you can tell that this is like the team now. Like these are the screenwriters, yes. the editors, the direction, you know, that there's like a through line from four onward um, that you don't get in those earlier films. And I kind of like the more scattershot feeling of those earlier films. And as I think we've talked about it here, and I've talked about it with many people in many situations, I just think Brian De Palma is the best of those filmmakers um, who have ever made a Mission Impossible. And I think that his, the very first one, has a level of like paranoia and and discomfort that the other ones are more like traditional action movies that really makes me... I like that first one the best still, but I'm still excited for seven yeah. and eight. I still think they look dope. I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to see whatever they have in store for us. So in terms of movies that I saw this year, I have once again, two, I have a documentary and then a, a regular film, uh, that are my two favorites. Uh, my, the documentary that I saw was really incredible. It was called a decent home or, uh, in Spanish it's called uno, uno gar digno. Um, and it is a bilingual uh, um, documentary about the ways in which predatory companies buy up trailer parks that are family run and then like jack up the prices to try to drive the residents out. And a lot of these people might own the, the home, like the trailer home, but they don't own the land because that's how trailer parks work. And so many of them have been in these places for so long and they've been able to like realize their dream of home ownership, but because it's not included with, it's not conjoined with land ownership, which those of us who have traditional homes have the luxury of having, they can just be forced off this land that they've lived on for decades. Um, and it, it costs a fortune to move those houses, a small fortune. And many of these yeah. people are not going to be able to afford that because they could barely afford to purchase and live in this trailer in the first place. And so now they have to try to figure out whether they can even move their mobile home. If it's been in the same spot for decades, a lot of times if they try to move them, they just fall apart. Um, and so yeah. it was a documentary that was specifically about that. Um, in like four or five different parks around the country, one of which is like here in the Iowa City area. It's up in North Liberty. Um, and so we went to a showing that was at the local theater and then they had like a, a big talk with the director and some of the people, the local people who were directly affected by it. And it was really affecting to to be able to watch the film and then hear the the very people who were in it talk about the ways that they're still trying to keep their homes safe. Um, and it made me really mad at my local government for not doing more to help those people. So whenever you leave a movie with fire in your belly, I feel like it's a success. And then my second, my other favorite movie is maybe a little silly, but it, I'm going to say what it is. It is Columbo suitable, suitable for framing. I went on a bender and watched the first two seasons of Columbo which are all TV movies. So I'm counting in the movie section. Um, and Columbo's great. It's on Amazon prime. You watch them. They're incredible. Columbo movies are so much fun and suitable for framing. I think was, as I was looking at this list of them and I was like, which one was that? Which one was that? That was the one that I was like, I know exactly what suitable for framing was. So I was like, that must've been my favorite. Cause I remember exactly what it was. Uh, 
<laughs> Peter O'Toole nice. is a great main character and any movie that has him in it is elevated. And when he gets to play the curmudgeonly detective who's too smart for his own good, all the better. So I really like Columbo and it's fun to go watch those, uh, those old Columbo movies. Very nice. And then last thing I wanted to mention, you played any video games? I know you haven't had a whole lot of time to play video games this year, but has anything stuck out to you in the realm of, of interactive media? Uh, and I don't even remember if it was this year, honestly, the last, well, I have really enjoyed a lot of vampire survivors on my steam deck. Um, that's, that's been, uh, that's been fun. That's Hell been yeah. And, uh, going through mass effect legendary, uh, that whole trilogy again, relatively recently, whenever that came out, that was great. That was good. Did you play through the whole thing again? Oh yeah. Yeah. what do you, what did you do at the end? Yep. Which, which portal did you walk to in that? sadly disappointing ending. So I think this last time I, I have done all of the endings. I think this last time I did destroy again to, uh, just to make sure I got the scene. You got the the end where you see, yeah, you see the breath and the chest rise. Um, you know, we could have a whole conversation on which ending is is the better of the bad choices that they gave us. But I mean, I think that's really about it. That's the thing is it is three bad choices. It is. Which, you know, it whatever, is. whatever. I am very, very curious to see what they do with this new Mass Effect game. Because oh which choice is canon? And like, are the rumors true? Did Shepard survive? Are you really going to bring Shepard back? I don't want them to, but it sure sounds like, according to the rumors, they might bring Shepard back. In the which case, then the one that my renegade Femshep picked, which was destroy and get the breath at the end because I did enough stupid multiplayer missions to get my stupid galactic readiness up. Yeah, I played that multiplayer so that I could get my galactic readiness as high as possible on my old Xbox 360 so that Femship could survive that sucker, and she did. So maybe that's the canon okay, so play. Okay, question for you. Uh-huh. Question for you. What is more pathetic? You playing a lot of multiplayer so you could get your galactic readiness up, or me, who didn't really have time because I was in residency to play the multiplayer, so I put the stupid Mass Effect app on my phone and made sure that during the day I was continually sending out missions because that was another way to get your galactic readiness up. That was how I got my galactic readiness all the way to the max, was playing, quote, air quotes around the word playing there, that stupid Mass Effect app. <laughs> Because you could do that instead of doing multiplayer. <laughs> I don't think that's more pathetic. I think they're equally bad. So here's the nice thing that's done away with in legendary. You don't get the half penalty for not engaging in those things. You do not. Well, that's they good to get know. away with that. I have legendary. I bought it on my PlayStation like the day it came out and I played for about an hour. And then I was like, I hate playing this game on a PlayStation controller because I have played it enough on my Xbox 360 that I need my offset sticks guys what's going on why does a PS4 controller suck so bad it's also on Game Pass (laughs) so I have it downloaded to my Xbox right now and I played about an hour and then I just haven't touched it since because I've been doing other stuff sure well and I know you've played some other games so what about you yeah uh so I in terms of game I, I have a game that came out this year Mm, two games that came out this year. I, I'm, I'm talking too much, but that's fine. There are two games that came out this year that deserve shout outs. And then one game that did not come out this year, except sort of, cause it came to this console this year. Um, that's persona five. I've already talked about persona five. Y'all go play persona five. If you got mm-hmm. access to it, freaking rules. It's an extremely good JRPG. Um, I had an incredible time, top 10 game of all time, but I've already talked about it. You don't have to talk about it again. Um, the two games that came out this year that I was really impressed by, um, are Norco, which came out in February or March. Um, and then Signalis that came out in like late October. Have you heard of either of these games? They both sound familiar, but I am not. Well, Norco is on your Xbox. 
yeah. if you have Game Pass. So you've probably heard of it if you got Game right. Pass emails saying, hey, Norco is on this now. And Signalis was in your Humble Bundle in October. So, because oh, it's a Humble... Well, I it's, it's, it, well, you have access to it through the Humble Choice Trove thing because it's published by Humble Bundle. I don't know that you actually okay. get to own it. You yeah. have to download it through them. But it's also it's also on Game Pass. I played it on my Xbox through Game Pass. Um, but Norco is a really beautiful narrative game that is kind of set in like a sort of semi-future cyberpunk or alternate reality where like, yeah, robots exist or whatever, but like it still feels like so real and so down to earth like the best cyberpunk does. Um, and it basically tells the story you play as Kay, who is this woman who is kind of estranged from her family. Um, and she comes home because her mother has died. And so her brother is alone and she's come home to like take care of business, get the estate in order. What estate? Estate. They're poor. They're poor people who live in Norco, New Orleans. They don't have an estate. But like deal with the fallout of my mom just died. And so... A lot of really strange things happen that I don't want to spoil, um, but it goes in a lot of really unexpected and beautiful places and really speaks to the reality of what it's like to be poor in America and dealing with things like the healthcare system, dealing with things like, uh, you know, trying to find a job, trying to keep a job, trying to make enough money trying to navigate bureaucracies and all those sorts of things in a really thoughtful, really meaningful way. Um, and it's, it's short. I pl think I played it in four, four and a half hours. I played it in two sittings essentially. Um, but it was incredible. Uh, it was really, really good. Um, and then Signalis, uh, is another game that is also short. I think I played that over four or five hours, maybe five or six. It's a little bit longer. Um, but that is like kind of, it's a PS1 era graphics game. Um, and mm -hmm. it has kind of the, the play style of like a Metal Gear Solid or a Resident Evil where you're like sneaking around in like a spooky base and, and you have very limited ammo um, and resources. Um, and you're trying to find, basically you are, you play as this like replicant this like robot person who is trying to find her her partner her just her gestalt who's the other person who was in her ship with her um essentially it, it, you eventually find out it's essentially her lover she's trying to find her lover who has gone missing in this abandoned mining station and there's like zombies and all this sort of stuff um and it's extremely affecting and and evocative and spooky and and just has the some of the best vibes that i've had in a video game in a very okay. long time in terms of just like capturing a feeling and making you sit in that feeling so i really liked signalis a lot cool and i'm like three hours into everybody's game of the year according to the game awards uh thanks black friday mm. i bought elden ring there you go. I'm three hours in. I'm very bad at it, but I'm gonna give it a try. I'm gonna give it. I'm gonna see how far I can get in Elden Ring. You'll have to let me know. I keep meaning to. Uh, I keep meaning to give it a try, and uh, I just haven't been brave enough. Well, so I think we've talked about how, like, I think both of us really admire Souls likes and Souls games specifically, but neither of us feel like we're mm -hmm. very good at them because. I don't know. I think you're like me. It's like when I play a game, I put it on, oh, there's a easy mode. Great. There's story that's even easier than easy, even better. Like mm -hmm. I'm here for a good if time. I I'm not here for a tough time. Correct. Yeah. And so totally. I get intimidated by Souls games because, you know, I don't have that benefit. Um, but I really like what I've seen in Elden Ring so far and I like how open it is because I've been hitting my head against this boss and after I died three or four times against this boss I was like screw this I'm gonna go explore someplace else like I didn't feel like I was being as gate kept as I have other times I've tried to play like you know I have Dead Souls 3 that I got in a humble bundle or whatever and I installed it and you get to this boss and it's like there's literally nothing you can do until you get past this boss. And so, like, I tried hitting my head against that boss a few times, and I was like, 
I can't. Uh, there's nothing more for me. I guess I'm not playing this game. But in Elden Ring, when I hit my head against that boss a few times, I was like, I'm just going to nope on out of here and do some more exploring, get some more runes so that I can get some more levels, and then hopefully find some new gear, find some better weapons, come back and spank this dude when I'm a bit stronger. Yeah. Nice. So I'll keep you posted. Okay. I look forward to it. Anyway, thanks for chatting about our year roundup with me, Peter. It was fun. Yeah, it was. It was good. I have a lot of new music suggestions that I want to listen to based on the things you were talking about. So that's always exciting. <laughs> yeah. And, and you're probably we, like... We, we have you, another X-Men movie to watch. Yeah, and you probably heard me talk about all my music tastes, and you're like, dude, this kid has the weirdest music taste. What the hell <laughs> is he you know, listening to? <laughs> Just because you have much more broad music taste than me doesn't mean that that's weird. I just am very narrow. Oh, it's weird. I mean, I like a lot of metal. I like almost every subgenre of metal. But outside of that, you know, I'm really picky. So it's fair. all good. Fair, fair, fair. All right. Yeah, we'll be back in a couple of weeks with uh, X-Men Ac- Apocalypse as our winter of our X-Content continues perfect i love that it'll be a lot of fun and uh it'll be good to talk about it have a happy holidays everyone and i hope you have a great day absolutely as well